We're good now. Okay. Okay, guys. Sorry about that. So let's go ahead and pick back up. So we're going to spend the majority of the rest of the class period talking about other fringe benefits. So when we say fringe benefits, what we're really talking about here are benefits provided by an employer to an employee. And these aren't major things, like your salary, okay? Um, these are more um, things like disability insurance, health insurance, paid parking, things like that, okay? Some of them they will advertise to you when you um, interview for a job, and some of them maybe not. Maybe you'll be more of a surprise, okay? So we're going to talk about fringe benefits and what is included or excluded from gross income, okay? And I do have a sheet I would like to give y'all guys. It is on D2L as well. Um, this is a list of things from Chapter 5 that are excluded from gross income. $5,000 a year can be excluded. Athletic facilities. If the employer provides a track or a gym on site, that is um, excluded from gross income. Okay? Next. Educational assistance programs. If the employer provides assistance, up to $52.50 per year can be excluded. That includes tuition, fees, books, and supplies. It does not include meals, lodging, transportation costs. Um, and it can't be a pay a payment, this is on slide 34, a payment for something like um, uh, like a hobby class, like a photography class, okay? If you're working at an accounting firm and they pay for a photography class, that's a hobby class and um, that would not be covered under this benefit, okay? Adoption assistance programs. Often employers will help you cover the cost of an adoption because adoptions are expensive. The exclusion amount is limited to $13,460 in 2016. And there are phase outs. Once you have the AGI over $200,001.920, no, um, the phase outs work very similar to the phase out calculations we have done for exemptions. Um, Cafeteria plan. So I'm sure you guys have heard of cafeteria plans, just maybe don't know what they are. Uh, I think they're called cafeteria plans because it's kind of like walking through a cafeteria line and you can choose, okay, do I want you to run steak? Do I want fried catfish? Do I want salad? You can pick and choose what you want, okay? Often employers offer cafeteria plans. These plans, they're very, it's pretty simple. You get to choose. Do you want the non-taxable benefit or would you rather have cash? Okay? Often employers have this. Just by virtue of having a non-taxable benefit in a cafeteria plan, that does not make that benefit non-taxable. Okay? If it stays in the cafeteria plan and the non-taxable benefit is chosen, it remains not taxable. But if the employee chooses cash instead, that cash is taxable. So there is an example in the book. This is example 19. We have Hawk Corporation, okay? And they offer life insurance to their employees 
or cash of $200. So this is a cafeteria plan since the employee can choose. They offer hospitalization insurance worth or, I oh, shouldn't say worth, I should say or $2,400. They also offer child care premiums or $1,800. So if you have a taxpayer, like in the example, and they choose the life insurance and the child care, but forego the hospital insurance and take the cash, how, what is their taxable income here? $2,400, okay? If I said what is excluded here, what would you say? $2,000. And that brings me to an important point. On your exam, please make sure you read the questions. When you're taking the CPA exam, please make sure you read the questions. Often you know the answer, it's just asking what is excluded or what is included. Make sure you read the last sentence and figure out what are they actually asking me to calculate here. Okay? Alright. Um, so, that's how cafeteria is work. Flexible spending plans, I don't really want to talk about this now. We're going to sit on it and we'll talk about it a little bit later. If you'll remember last time I briefly talked about um, health savings accounts, and I said, okay, just sit on this. You're not tested on this now. We will come back to it in a later chapter when it is covered in greater detail. So right now, we'll just have a little shout out to flexible spending plans and say they're there and um, they're non taxable We will come back to it later. Okay. Now we are going to talk about some other non taxable benefits. And I will say that there are a fair amount of questions on the exam on these non-taxable benefits. So I would make sure you know um, which ones are non-taxable, which all you have to do is look at the list that I handed out. But a lot of these also have limits. So you need to make sure you know what the limits are. Okay? So the first, this is on slide 38. And the first one we're going to talk about is no additional cost service. Okay? So, a no additional cost service is non-taxable if an employee receives services, keyword services, not property, services, there is no substantial additional cost to the, provide, to the employer in providing the service. They're offered within the same line of business that the employee works and it's offered on a non-discriminatory basis. That means it is offered to everybody, not just people that are high up in the company. A good example of this would be someone who works for an airline and they receive flights, okay, from the airline. Now, of course, you can say there are some additional costs that the airline has by letting him ride on the plane, more weight, more baggage to transport, you know, more peanuts for them to eat, but those are not considered to be additional substantial cost. So there's always going to be some additional minor cost, okay, but not substantial. When I worked in law school, I worked for a bar review company and I sold bar courses and my compensation was that I received my bar course for free, which those cost like five dollars so that would be a no additional cost service. Yes, there are some, you know, paper materials that come with the course, but what you're really paying for is the service, is the course itself. Okay. <clears throat> employee discounts. Some of you probably work somewhere where you get an employee discount. Okay. These are non-taxable if the discount is not on real estate or investment property. So those are two things you cannot offer a discount on. It must be in the same line of business that the employee works. And please note these two limits. The discount can't exceed gross profit on property or 20% of customer price on services. So we have different thresholds depending upon if it is for the sale of property 
or for the sale of services. And it has to be offered on a non-discriminatory basis. So let's look at an example. Example 22 in the book. In this example, we have Silver Corporation. They operate a department store. They sell a TV to an employee for $300. The cost to customers, regular customers, is $500, okay? And they have a gross profit percentage of 25%. They also sell a service contract for the TV, and they sell it to the employee for $120. They normally sell this contract for $150 to its regular customers. So the question is, how much income does this employee have to recognize, or what is included in income? Okay, so let's talk about the TV itself first. So the standard is it cannot exceed the gross profit on the property. Okay, so what is um, the gross profit? So the TV sells for $500 to a regular customer. Okay. So when you subtract out the 25% gross profit, so we'll say 25% of $500, which equals, make sure I get the math right, $125. That means that this company makes a profit, or their costs or whatever is $375, okay? This, pro this piece is their profit. So that means that when they sell it to their employee, it must be, for it to not be included in income, it has to be $375 or above, okay? So when they sold it to an employee, they sold it for how much? $300. So this employee has an income of $75 from purchasing this TV, okay? Because they sold it for less than their profit ratio, profit percentage. And then with their service contract, okay? Um, it normally sells for $150, and we look at 20% of the customer price on this. The discount can't exceed 20% of the customer price, okay? So um, the discount basically is going to be 20% of 150, which equals 30, okay? So now we take 150 minus 30, which equals 1. Okay, so another way of saying this is the discount can't exceed, you know, basically they cannot pay um, less than 80% of the price to the customer. It's saying the same thing. In my opinion, it's saying it a little bit easier to understand. The discount can't exceed 80% of what we pay to the customers. Or the way that they say it for the code is it can't, the can't exceed 20% of the customer price on the services. So the amount here, how much is the employee paying? $120. And since this is our threshold is $120, they're not going to have any income to recognize from the services. They're only going to recognize $75 from the TV. A working condition approach. 
So a few will remember last time I did point out to you, I said, you know what, you should really go ahead and take a look at Schedule A. Schedule A is where all the itemized deductions are reported. Although we will not start talking about itemized deductions until the last couple weeks of class, it is one of those things that we really do touch on all semester. So it will make your life a little easier if you go ahead and memorize the things that are itemized deductions. Don't worry about learning all the different floors and the limits right now, but at least learn what is an itemized deduction. And one of the things that's on this list on Schedule A is line 21. Unreimbursed employee expenses. Job, travel, union dues, job education, etc. You also have some of these items under line 21 in your 1040 assignment. I'll tell you that too, okay? So these are things that an employee can take an itemized deduction on, things that relate to their job. So for example, if you're a licensed CPA, um, your dues that you pay to the state board every year, that would very much be something that qualifies here as one of these itemized deductions because it relates to your job and it's something your employer is not paying for, okay? So that's what this is, a working condition for each. If the employee, if, if the employer pays for these items that would otherwise be deductible as an itemized deduction under line 21, okay, um, then it is not included in the income. Okay? You see a lot of these things like um, job travel union dues, CPE classes, so when you take continuing education classes, when you go to conferences, when you pay for your licensing dues, things that you commonly see in this category, okay? Uh, uniforms, you can see uniforms there too. So, okay. Mm. okay. De minimis fringes. De minimis is Latin. It just means of minimal. Okay, so we're talking about small numbers here. These are things that it would be very difficult to keep track of. So the code has said um, they're excluded from income. Some of the things that are listed, although there are lots of things out there, okay, that could fall under this category. In fact, if you will remember at the you know, very beginning of class, before we got the camera working, we were talking about um, meals and travel. And we said for a meal to qualify, it must be provided on the premises of the employer. Well, a lot of meals aren't provided on the premises of the employer. Think about a holiday party, okay? Think about a work you do at a client site. Those things will not qualify under the uh, meals and lodging uh, exception that we talked about at the beginning of class. But it doesn't matter because they will qualify here as a de minimis fringe. Sometimes that happens. They don't fall into one category, but they fall into another and the result is the same. Okay? So if you have a meal that's not offered at the employer's res site, it cannot fall under the meals and lodging exception, but it likely does fall under this exception. This includes uh, company cocktail parties, Christmas parties, occasional use of company copying machines, supper money, etc. Okay, um, and that and there is a, in the book they talk about this notice, notice 2011-72. This is not something on the exam, but it might be something you're interested in. This came out a couple years back, see, five six years ago. This notice stands for the um, proposition that cell phones provided by an employer are not taxable under this idea of a fringe benefit, okay? They say so long as the cell phones are used for business purposes, okay? I think the standard in the book says, um, what does it say? The primary purpose has to be for business reasons. So, so long as the primary purpose for having the cell phone 
it's business reasons, um, it's excluded. And we all know cell phones are expensive now, monthly fees are expensive. In my life, that's not a de minimis amount, but they still consider that to be de minimis. Okay, so know that the standard for de minimis is not $5. Okay, it's higher than that. Okay? Subsidized eating facilities um, are also considered to be de minimis. I used to do a lot of work at a certain um, client and they had a Luby's in their basement and it was subsidized. So the value of that subsidization, that's probably not the right word, but um, is uh, excluded from income. Okay. If the employer provides transportation, uh, so let's say they pay for your parking, they pay for your bus pass, that is not something you have to include in income. There is a cap of $255 per month in 2016. When I left downtown Houston, my parking uh, every month was a little over $200. So if you're working in Manhattan or Chicago, $255 is not enough money. But probably if you're working anywhere in Texas, $255 is enough. Maybe not in Austin. I don't know. I went to Austin for a conference the other day and I had to pay $40 a night to park. I'm not too happy about that. So, <clears throat> that, that $255 applies for either parking or to ride on some sort of bus or tram, some sort of public transportation. There's also, if you ride your bicycle, you can get $20 a month excluded from it. We don't have a lot of bicycle commuters in Texas. Okay. Um, it can either be paid directly by the employer to the vendor or it can be a reimbursement. It doesn't matter for purposes of the code which form it takes, it's still excluded from income. Okay. <clears throat> Moving it. If the employer pays for your moving expenses, um, that is also something you exclude from gross income. If your employer doesn't pay for your moving expenses, there is an above the line deduction for them that we will talk about in the next chapter after the break. Okay? But if your employer pays for them, not included in income. Okay, nothing to report. If your employer provides some retirement planning services, that is not included in income. I told y'all for this chapter, this is slide 46, it would be a lot of, and this isn't included, and this isn't included. There's a lot more to say. So. Okay, notice that some of the things that I mentioned um, have that provision, that little bullet at the bottom that says, this is slide 47, um, this cannot be provided on um, a discriminatory basis. That means that if the higher ups get the benefit, but the lower downs don't, um, then it turns it off, okay? But it only turns it off for the highly compensated employees, okay? Um, not for everybody. I'm trying to see if highly compensated is defined in the book, and it is not defined in the book what highly compensated is. It's probably um, subjective. But the non-highly compensated employees can still exclude the benefits. Okay? But the highly compensated cannot. If there is some sort of discrimination going on for these services. Okay. The next exclusion we're going to talk about briefly is the foreign earned income exclusion. So, I don't know that I've talked about this in this class, but in the U.S., we have a system of worldwide taxation. That means that if you are a resident or a citizen of the U.S., 
you are taxed on 100% of your taxable income. It does not matter whether you earn the income in France. Okay? You are taxed on all of it. So, this is interesting. Not all countries have this system. Okay? We kind of take it for granted that everybody does it the same way as the U.S. That is not true at all. In fact, when it comes to tax laws, the U.S. in a lot of ways is very unique. Okay? Um, Mexico just recently, in the last couple years, completely redid their tax code and they made it a lot more similar to the U.S. tax code, um, including um, they made it a worldwide, a worldwide tax regime. So that means it doesn't matter where you generate your income, uh, the U.S. is going to tax it. Why does this suck? Well, because if you go and you earn income in Germany, you know who else is going to tax it? Germany. So you're going to be paying taxes in two countries for the same income. So the code has come up with some fixes for us. Okay? The first one, which is what we're going to talk about today, is the foreign earned income exclusion. The second one is a deduction for foreign taxes paid. And the third one is a credit for foreign taxes paid. There is one more that I will mention that is not in the code. Treaty benefits. The purpose of all these four items are to alleviate the burden of double taxation of the same income. So, treaty benefits, we are not discussing in this class. That is outside of the scope of this class. A treaty is when we have a contract with another country, and that country and the U.S. agree on tax treatment of certain items for people that could be citizens of either, or residents of either, or have income in either, different standards, okay? We're not talking about that Deductions. No one uses deductions. Ever. Um, I've never seen anyone use a deduction. So, we're not going to talk about it. It's not even in the book. Okay? Most of my clients use the credit. And we will spend time at the end of the semester discussing the foreign tax credit. Okay? Most people use the credit. We are going to talk right now about the exclusion. The exclusion is not used as often. Why? Let's look at the board on slide 48. To qualify for the exclusion, the person must be a bona fide resident of a foreign country or be physically present in that foreign country for at least 330 days during any consecutive 12 months. That's a high standard, and most people probably aren't going to meet that. Okay, most people are not a resident of the foreign country and are not physically there for that large a period of time. For most of us, this just doesn't happen. But you can have, I have foreign income. For example, if you um, have stocks and the company is in England and they pay a dividend, that um, is subject to British taxation. Okay? So, regular everyday people will have income that is taxed in other countries. You don't actually have to go and work there to have income, okay? So, um, but for this exclusion, you have to either be a resident of a foreign country or be present for at least 330 days during any 12 consecutive months. So, I'm not a fan of calculating things on the calendar, okay? But there is an example on example 26. In this example, we had someone who arrived in a foreign country on March 10th, 2015, and left on February 15th, 2016. So the standard is to qualify for the exclusion, and they're not a resident of the foreign country. They have to be in that country for 330 days for any 
12 consecutive months. Here, that standard is met. Now, we're really almost there the whole year. I'm not calculating it on the calendar, but just that is definitely greater than, three, than um, 330 days. Okay? Um, the second thing you have to consider with this exclusion is something called qualified days. Okay? This means days that you are actually earning the income in that country. Okay? So let's look in at, at an example. This is example 27. Keith Cup qualifies for the foreign earned income exclusion. He was in France for all of 2016. <coughs> There is a limit, I forgot to mention this, for the exclusion of $101,300 in 2016. So this is the limit. Now, he was in France for all of 2016, um, and all of these days were qualifying days. Okay? Um, so, he had $120,000 that was earned in France. How much of this is he going to be able to exclude from income? What do y'all think? What do you think? That's right. Okay? The exclusion amount of $101,000 thousand three hundred okay that is how much they can exclude from income the difference if we said how much is included in income 120 minus 101 300 okay now the second part of the problem says okay assume that instead only 339 days in 2016 were qualifying Okay, are dates that he was considered to be earning an income in France. So how much of an exclusion is he going to get? Now we have to prorate this exclusion and figure out how much he gets to take. So if 339 were qualifying and three, 2016 was a leap year, so out of 366 days, the total exclusion that he normally could get is 101,300. So that means his prorated exclusion is 93,827. Okay? Now he had still had income in France of 120,000. So that means out of this 120,000, you know, approximately. 26,000 is going to be included in income. Right? Because this is how much he gets to exclude. Yes? Okay, they're using 366, like, when we come out, we use like 365, because you know it's only 365 days in a year. Um, no. There, just 2016 was a leap year. Okay. That's fine. So. Um, <clears throat> okay. That's pretty much it for that exclusion. Um, in my opinion, people don't use the exclusion a lot. Well, for one reason, all my clients are companies. Companies can't use the exclusion. Okay? Only individuals can. But even for individuals, the limit is 101, 300, which I know sounds like a lot of money. Um, right now, but in 10 years, it won't be, okay? Um, so, there's that reason. Also, we have this residency or being physically there requirement. Most people aren't going to meet that, okay? So, the that for those reasons, I don't see the exclusion used very often.
The next topic I want to talk about is um, interest-free bonds. Now, you do have some interest-free bonds on your 1040 assignment. I encourage you, after the exam on Wednesday, go home, look over those facts, and you'll be surprised at how many things on that assignment you already know the answers to. Okay? One of those we're about to discuss right now, interest-free bonds. So if you, if you have a um, state or local bond, the interest is exempt from federal income tax. If you have a federal bond, The interest is exempt from state and local taxation. So, this is due to the Constitution not allowing uh, state governments to be taxed by the federal governments and vice versa. So, if you have a federal bond is it subject to federal taxation? Yes, very much so. Don't forget that. State and local bonds are exempt from federal income tax. Not federal bonds. Federal bonds, the interest from federal bonds is very much subject to federal income tax. Similarly, State and local jurisdictions can tax state interest from state and local bonds. Okay? on the bracket of the taxpayer. We talked about this last week. It's an ordinary dividend. It's subject to tax at ordinary income rates. So what are we talking about now? We're talking about when a corporation declares a dividend and pays a dividend, how much is taxable to the shareholder as a dividend. Now, I know this is a little strange because essentially what we have here is something that's a concept of corporate law versus something that's in the tax code. So, what is taxable as a dividend is not necessarily the same thing as what the corporation calls a dividend. Okay? I want to say, and I'm going to show you how this works. So the tax, taxing something as a dividend is not the same as when the corporation says we declare a dividend. So I'm going to give you a simple example. Let's say we have a corporation and they declare a $100 dividend to the shareholder. Now, for some of you, you may be planning on taking a class in corporate tax when you get in a grad program, and then you will learn all about this. For a lot of you, that won't ever happen. So we do talk about this briefly, and you need to know because we're talking about individual income tax, and often the individuals are the shareholders. So what we're talking about here is taxation to the shareholder. 
We're not talking about taxation to the corporation. Okay? So there is a three-tiered approach. It's a waterfall approach, meaning you start at the top and you work your way down. Okay? So we start at the top. Taxable as a dividend Ordinary or qualified depending upon the holding period, okay? Okay, to the extent of corporation earnings and profit now, we are not going to get into a detailed conversation about earnings and profits, but these are calculated at the corporate level annually, and they basically reflect the earnings of the corporation. If you ever do a corporate tax return, you will be expected to calculate EMP. Okay? EMP, earnings and profits. It's, it has somewhat of a similarity to retained earnings. It is not the same thing, but it relates to retained earnings. The second tier is tax-free to the shareholder to the extent of return of capital. We have said it multiple times in this class that any time you have a return of capital or a return of your basis, that is tax-free. Why? Because that's your investment. That's what you've paid into it. Okay? So this is essentially the same as your basis in your shares. How much you have paid for it. Okay. And the last tier of the waterfall is capital gain. If there's anything left over, it is classified as capital gain, either long-term or short-term, depending upon how long you have held the shares. So let's do a simple example. Let's say this corporation has a $100 dividend. And the corporation has $50 of ENP, earnings and profits. And we'll say that this shareholder has a basis in shares of $20. So let's start at the top. There's a $100 dividend. How much of it is going to be taxable as a dividend to the shareholder? Fifty, right? Because that is the amount of the ENP of the corporation. This will either be a qualified dividend or an ordinary dividend, depending upon how long the shareholder held their shares. Okay? Now moving down to the second category. So $50 is going to be taxable as a dividend. How much is going to be a tax-free return of capital? $20. Please note, this piece is tax-free. No taxes are due from Tier 2 because this is the taxpayer's basis. Now, after this dividend, their basis is reduced to zero because they have essentially used up their basis as part of this dividend. Someone asked me in the last class, okay, so if they sell their shares that year for $50, how much gain will they have? Well, $50, because now their basis is going to be reduced to zero. Okay? The more that you can under, in fact, I just talked to someone who's taking the red portion of the CPA exam, which is all pretty much all tax. She told me that there are so many questions on movement of basis. The more that you can understand why basis is adjusted, why we move it, when it makes sense, the better off you'll be in understanding tax. 
And it's not really memorization, it's just understanding the concepts. We reduce the basis, but we're allowing this reduction tax-free. And then later, when the shares are sold, we have to recognize more gain, right? Because we have a lower basis. Now, the third tier is capital gain. How much is going to be capital gain here? Whatever's left, if anything. Sometimes you don't have anything left when you, after you get to this point. The whole dividend's been exhausted. But here we still have $30 that is capital gain. 30 plus 20 is 50, plus 50 is 100. Okay? If this taxpayer had a basis of 50 instead of 20, we would have zero capital gain because it's a waterfall. You stop okay, when you get to the number of the dividend. So that's how dividends work. Stock dividends, I will mention very briefly, sometimes shareholders receive stock instead of cash. The general rule is that stock dividends are tax-free. They are, are excluded from tax, okay? There are a lot of exceptions, but general rule, not subject to tax. Topic. Educational savings bonds. If you purchase a bond to pay for your child's education, so long as the amount is used for education, it is excluded from gross income. Please note there are some phase out thresholds. You don't need to know them for your exam, but there are some phase out thresholds. I don't even know if the thresholds are. Yes, they are mentioned on the bottom of page 524 if you're interested in those phase-outs. They work exactly like the phase-outs that we have calculated in this class. So, um, they have to be used for the payment of educational expenses. It does include room and board. So note that. It does include room and board, which is different than scholarships. So, um, if you look... There's an example in the book, and I'm going to kind of throw my own example into it. In this example, we have a parent who bought a bond um, for $20,000, and then by the time their son started school, the bond was worth $30,000, okay? Why? Because of interest. This interest that accumulates, accumulates tax-free, okay? There's no interest income from this interest because it's for an education bond. Let's say that in year one, the son has $7,500 of educational expenses. If the mother takes out $7,500, nothing is included in income of the son. If the mother takes out $10,000, then how much will be included in it? $2,500, right? You only get tax-free treatment to the extent um, that, and actually I wouldn't say all $2,500, I would say um, probably one-third of $2,500. This isn't in the book as an example. Because the reality is 20000 of it was your investment, okay? So only one-third of this is attributed to interest. So the percentage of it that is related to your investment or your capital investment is not going to be income. So it's really only going to be the difference. I don't think there is an example that on that specifically, but... That's how it works. Um, she has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's, um, so is that going to go to like the parents or the son? It's the son that has to include it in income. Even though he didn't. I think it's the son's income. Let me check. I guess it would depend on how it was set up or what kind of bond it is, honestly. Because there are some programs, like 529 plans, where 
the child, it is set up on behalf of the child, and then there are some that it really is set up for the parents. So I guess it would depend on how the bond was set up, okay? Because I'm looking in the book, and there are different kinds of plans. So depending on, like, my son has a 529 educational plan, and that plan is just for him. It is in his name. I'm the trustee until he becomes of age. In that case, it would be him. But with this bond that this taxpayer is setting up, um, it's not really set up on behalf of her son. So, but it doesn't really go into that much detail in the book, but that's how it works. Okay. Tax benefit rule, we talked about at the beginning of class. I'm not going to talk about it again. The last topic in this chapter is discharge of indebtedness. So the general rule with discharge of indebtedness is that it is included in income, okay? So the general rule is discharge of indebtedness is included in income. There are a ton of exceptions, which is why it's listed in this chapter. These are all the exceptions up here in the board, and there are actually more than that. But um, so if you fall under one of these exceptions, then your discharge of indebtedness will be tax free. So I think I've given you all an example of discharge of indebtedness. But let's say you owe $50,000 on your credit cards, and you don't have the money to pay it. So uh, Chase Bank says, okay, we'll let you pay us $35,000. In this case, you have $15,000 of cancellation of debt income that you have to report. Okay? This is not going to qualify for any kind of an exception. Okay. But these are the exceptions up here on the board. Um, some of the exceptions. <coughs> this is pretty much it for this chapter. So, that's it. So, I'll see y'all Wednesday.